this is going to be an interesting video. The only thing that is proved is the fact that I want to punch Tom in the face. He sees him like literally crawl out the window. It is a YouTuber. Maybe I'll cut this out of the video. We'll see how, how much I want you to guess. Greetings, friends. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. My name is Mel and today I bring you a video that I have been thinking about for a minute now. Not necessarily this installment but this format and it is finally here. We are thriving. We are ready. I am pumped and it's about to be a very interesting cool time. So today you guys already saw it on the title. I am going to be reading Tom Hiddleston's favorite books. And this is Future Mel interjecting to give a massive thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Bright Seller. If you guys are not familiar, Bright Sellers is a monthly wine subscription that was founded by two MIT grad students who just wanted to make wine lovers' life a lot easier and get wine delivered to their doorstep every single month. What's super cool about Bright Sellers is that it's super easy. You literally just need to take a 30 second quiz on their website and their special algorithm will match you to the best wines given your specific taste that is guaranteed to be the best match. Now, if you guys are like me, I always like to know exactly how to pair wines, how to take full advantage of them and just bring out those notes and those tastes even brighter. So each personalized wine does come with its own special card, giving you serving and pairing tips. So again, you can take the most advantage of them. And as always, the more you rate and give feedback, the better your matches will get. But they have a delight guarantee, which basically means that if you didn't like one of the matches that they sent you on that month's box, you can give the feedback and they will replace that bottle in the next month's box. They have totally sustainable and recycled recyclable packaging that is plastic free and is also a small footprint box. So if you do want to sign up to Bright Sellers and get your own special box every single month, you can click the link at the top of the description and get 60% off your very first order, meaning that you will get four bottles for $38 and you can rest assured that those will be the perfect matches for you. Yes, the Hiddles, the Toms. Tom Hiddleston, if you don't know, Loki from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He has been in Kong Island. He has been on Crimson Peak and a bunch of other other movies and shows as well. He is also a theater actor. I think if you don't know Tom Hiddleston at this point, you have definitely been living in an alternate universe, which <laughs> very fitting. But I think you have been living in an alternate universe because he is literally everywhere. And of course, I have been tuning in and watching every single Wednesday. Me and my patrons do a watch party every Wednesday and we've just been having a wonderful time. I watch it with my brother too, so it's like an all around like event. And I have been absolutely adoring this show. I think it's very fitting that I'm starting this video right now as well. Today is Tuesday. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we get the very last episode of Loki. Now, the reason why this video idea came up about is that I have been getting requests to do reading like videos, whether it's reading like a booktuber, reading like a certain musician, celebrity, actor, whatever it is. And I thought what better way to do it than to start with somebody whose work ethic I really admire. And I really like his approach with acting. If you guys don't know me, I have also done theater in the past. So anytime I hear him talk about acting and how he studies his characters and how he gets so into it and all of the research that goes behind it, it's really admirable to see how how he goes about acting. It's a very conventional, non-conventional way. And every time I watch one of his interviews, I am so in awe of how coherent he sounds, about how smart he sounds with acting and how everything just comes through so clearly when he explains why he does certain things or his approach again with acting. I think it's really freaking cool. Now, one of the things he does a lot according to interviews is that he reads books a lot in preparation to certain roles so he can get himself in the mindset so he can do a little bit of character studies to see what personality he can bring to these characters and to see what unique ad he can add besides what is already on the script. That is where this idea was born. He tends to talk about books a lot in his interviews, which I really appreciate because it gave me an extensive list to choose from based on things that I have been loosely interested in or really interested in. So one of those websites is goodbooks.io and this says 37 books recommended by Tom Hiddleston. And in this list, I actually actually found quite a bit to work with. In here, we see The Great Gatsby, we see Anna Karenina, we see Dracula. I also found a Tumblr blog that specializes specifically on finding out what books Tom Hiddleston is reading. And in one interview, he said, I collect books. I have so many books. My house is full of books, not specifically of anything, but probably more than anything else in my house. I have plays, loads and loads and loads and loads of plays and novels. My house is wall to wall books, basically. And for that, 
much respect because in this household, that's exactly what we have as well. I have chosen my books and they are all here and I am very excited. So the first book I am gonna start this video with is a book that was fairly short. I needed a shorter book within these classics videos that I am making this month. And this is a book that I've already read. I read it in high school, I loved it, and I thought it was the perfect chance to reread it and see where I stand now with this book. It's prose, let's get into it. Well, hello there. Let me just take off my earphone. I am obviously reading The Great Gatsby. I am currently 50 pages in. I just made it to page 50, which is chapter four. And I started the audiobook for this, which is interesting because there are so many audiobooks. I had to really search for one that was accurate in terms of like chapters. Now, here's the thing. I remember so little about this book because I feel like I read this forever ago and it's so just tangled up in my brain with like other stuff that I've read in between this and whatever I've read in the past. Like what, how long has it been? Like five, six years. And I freaking love the writing for this and that is one thing that i was like concerned about going back into like classics which i've only read like a handful few the writing in this is really beautiful and i really like the way that f scott fitzgerald includes all of the societal commentary in here in a way where it doesn't really slap you across the face but it's really deep rooted in how these characters are acting and how all of these characters are trying to find themselves in a position of wealth power and status within society i I can go into the conversation about race as well when it comes to this particular book and how everything goes down but i think i'll i'll probably do that as the story goes on and again i think the commentary is so well done about how materialistic society is which is i mean honestly one of the bigger parts of the commentary especially it taking place in the 20s which is filled with like the glitz and the glamour and like the partying and again the status and the money and who's better than who and who has more money than who and who has the prettier dress and who's married to who it's all reduced to material things how concerned we are with how society perceives us and what society thinks and that is such an individual journey you can see how all of these women around nick and even nick himself are all doing these things to kind of get accepted because that's what everybody else is doing it's really well written i remember enjoying this a lot in high school and I am still enjoying this. I The audiobook is super short, like the book is short clearly. But I will definitely be finishing this tomorrow morning either before or after my workout. I kind of want to finish it before. Oh my god, I hate Tom. <laughs> I hate Tom so much in this book. It's honestly crazy how much I hate Tom, which is hilarious because this video is about Tom Hiddleston, but I really hate Tom in this book. The idea is if we don't look out, the white race will be utterly submerged. It's all scientific stuff. It's being proved. The only thing that is proved is the fact that I want to punch Tom in the face. And I hate that for us. <laughs> I shall see you guys tomorrow morning.
friends. So I have finished the first book for the video and I ended up rating this a three star. I think this book falls at a meh for me because although it did address a lot of really relevant conversations, I don't know if the ambiguous part of this book did enough for me. And granted, this is my personal opinion. I know a lot of people like love this book, like out of classics, this is one of the ones that is the most well received. Now to give you a little bit more context about what this book is about in case you have yet to read The Great Gatsby. In this one, our narrator is Nick Carraway and he is a bond trader that lives in Manhattan, yet he ends up renting a house in West Egg and the next town over is where all of the well-off rich people live, which is where his cousin Daisy Buchanan lives with her husband Tom. And then we have Tom who has a mistress named Myrtle and then he ends up meeting his neighbor who's Jay Gatsby, who is obviously one of the main characters in the book, The Great Gatsby. And Gatsby has a past with Daisy because they used to be romantically entangled. I think it was like five years in the past and Gatsby is a low-key a little bit obsessed with Daisy. And even though I don't agree with a lot of what Daisy is thinking or doing in this book, I will say one thing I appreciate her for is realizing how vulgar and ostentatious Gatsby's way of living is. And it seems like he is trying to compensate or to hide something. If you've read the book, then obviously like you know what route it takes. And I guess it speaks a lot to Daisy's strength as a character that she was able and willing to make those decisions happen, even if maybe those weren't the best for her. But it again addresses the conversation about society and status and how society will perceive you if you take a certain route. And obviously, Obviously, Nick is a super interesting character too. There is a turning point in this book where he talks about certain virtues of men and how they either tell the truth or they don't or they lie. And that's where you kind of realize that Nick doesn't necessarily always tell the truth. I guess it could fall under the unreliable narrator route because you never truly know what Nick is actually meaning, what he has embellished and what the actual truth is. And I think that brings a level of complexity to the story where you can't differentiate truth truth from fact and truth from lie. And I personally really like the way that that was executed in this book because it really leads you to wonder a lot about what is going on here. And obviously with Gatsby, there is so much to unpack here because I think Gatsby in particular, when we look at the title, like, oh, the great Gatsby, it's like, what makes Gatsby so great? Like, is he really great? Or is this just some sort of mockery to the American dream? And I, the way that I look at Gatsby scare is, is it a mockery? Is the American dream real? Did he attain it by doing all the shady shit that he did? Or did he do it by working really hard as people should? And what it comes down to, in my opinion, the American dream is like plain up bullshit. Like it doesn't exist. Unless you are white, the American dream is non-existent. There is nothing about the American dream that screams equality, that screams racial balance. There is nothing about it that screams any of those things. Get I both appreciate and not the ambiguousness that Fitzgerald writes this book in about the American dream, but I just don't necessarily love or agree with a lot of the racial choices or derogatory terms that were used in this book because I was listening to this and I was like, did he just drop that? in this book like so casually as if it was nothing and that leads me to the next point in this book which is like morality ethics justice and it's the fact that if you've read the again i'm not gonna go into spoilers in case you guys haven't read the book and you you know you'll read it for school or you'll read it just for enjoyment at the end of this book so much shit goes down and nobody is held accountable for them and what makes me really i guess angry about that is that Yes, I know what Fitzgerald is trying to do with those things and trying to, I guess, establish the conversation or the question of will these things get better? Will people actually be held accountable for these things? And will people continue to either get or not get away with these things? But also, it in my head, it's like they got away with it because they're white. And that's where this book kind of pisses me off because it's just so freaking white. And I know that this will probably be the case with all of the classics that I'm going to read or at least most of them. It's again like middle of the road because the writing was beautiful at times. I like a lot of what this book did, but just like I said, there are things that I also don't really like about this book that I just don't really love. So for book number two, we have obviously another classic and this 
is one that I've never read. I have watched the movie of it though. And I am really excited to finally dive into the book. I do have the audiobook and it is also narrated by Rosamund Pike. And that is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Now, as I was reading the list to you guys at the start of the video, where Tom talked about certain books that he read and he loved, he talks a lot about Jane Austen and he reads a lot of Jane Austen. I know it'll be very angsty. I know that. I am mentally prepared for Mr. Darcy and his angstiness. And I also know a lot of people want a Pride and Prejudice remake with Tom Hiddleston as Mr. Darcy. And look, I won't complain. Anything that has Tom Hiddleston in it, I will watch. And yes, I will go start this book now and I will update you guys along the way. people this is an update i'm literally fresh out of the shower right now but i do have an update for you in terms of reading i am also starting a readathon tonight with my patrons and we're gonna run throughout the entirety of the weekend so hopefully that will give me more than enough time and motivation to not only finish pride and prejudice which is going really well spoiler alert and then help me move on to the next video which is also reading like somebody else and it is a YouTuber. We're matching. It's a pretty moment. I also, I feel like my face is kind of red right now because the face has been cleansed today. Scrubs happened, peels happened, shaving happened, everything happened today. So it's just been a spa day. It's just been really good. But I am currently 95 pages into Pride and Prejudice. So almost at the 50% mark. And the audiobook for this, the one that's narrated by Rosamund Pike, definitely recommend. It's so good. I feel like her narrating skills are top tier, especially for for the story, the British accent is really working. I think why I was having so much difficulty reading this was because when I was reading this, I was trying to make a British accent happen in my head and it's just not. Like my Latina self cannot make that happen for the life of me. So I just, you know, that really helped envision the characters and the time period a lot better. I feel like now I am at a place where I'm a little bit more adequate to give you a synopsis than I was a day ago. So what this is about, we follow obviously the Bennett family. Primarily we follow Jane and Lizzie. And we follow the both of them as they get inserted into the role of womanhood in society in the 1800s, how they have to marry, how they have to be the lady of the house, how they have to excel at a variety of different subjects and areas in order to kind of comply with the requirements to be met as a good and worthy wife. And we follow them specifically as they meet Mr. Bingley and by consequence, Mr. Darcy, who is Mr. Bingley's friend. And Mr. Bingley takes a big interest to Jane and they start kind of going back and forth and meeting each other and like we say in Spanish, tanteando kind of like not obviously dating but definitely courting as they would say in the time period and again by consequence on the flip side we have Lizzie and Mr. Darcy who are very indifferent towards each other like I wouldn't even say hate because they don't they definitely match each other in wits and kind of stubbornness and I feel that's why they're personalities clash so much and why they're so infuriated by each other because they kind of mirror themselves in a lot of different ways. Mr. Darcy is a really big asshole, but I love him because he's just so cut and dry, plain answers, will tell you shit straight as it is, and I really love that about him. So we kind of follow them through that journey, and obviously we have a lot of side characters, like all of their sisters, and we also have their mom and their dad, and we have uh, Lizzie's friend, Charlotte, and freaking Mr. Collins, who I I hate with my entire being. Mr. Collins is literally everything wrong with toxic masculinity. I genuinely just hate his guts and how he feels entitled to not only a marriage with Lizzie, but to Lizzie because he is the heir of the Bennett estate. And so I really hate the way that he goes about this entire situation. He's so slimy and so manipulative. I really like what commentary he brings into the story again about toxic masculinity and about how sometimes, I mean, particularly men in that time period felt like they were entitled to certain things because they were men and because they were powerful and because they were associated with powerful people also like it's so interesting to me because i feel like in most books i i mean at least in the books that i read 
the mom figure is always the one that you end up loving and then by consequence the dad is the one that you end up kind of like being iffy about but in this scenario I love Mr. Bennett and I love how he constantly sides with Lizzie in a situation where her mother is constantly comparing her, her daughters and constantly putting them down because she wants to put Jane on a pedestal and she wants to sell Jane as this end-all be-all beautiful worthy goddess-like wife because she is the eldest daughter and I hate that in order to put Jane so high up, she needs to put her other daughters down. So it's almost like Jane doesn't stand by herself, but rather she stands on the expense of somebody else, which I don't like, or at least that's what Mrs. Bennett makes it seem like. And I just really have had such a tough road with Mrs. Bennett because she keeps saying dumb stuff that I'm just like, Mrs. Bennett, stop it, stop it right now. So I really like that Mr. Bennett is kind of the flip side of that and balances her out and is constantly I guess siding with Lizzie and saying like I know this is what your mother wants but this is not what I want so I guess you can go with your heart and I really like that about him and still he does some things that I don't necessarily agree with but overall he is kind of like the voice of reason in most situations which I really appreciate. I would say that Lizzie so far hasn't had her moment of stardom yet. It's very much been about Jane and Mr. Bingley though I do feel like we're entering Lizzie territory now kind of like at the halfway mark because because we already have the fallout between Mr. Bingley and Jane, so I feel like we're, again, entering Lizzie territory, which I am very much looking forward to. And it's really crazy to see, I guess, how far we've come in a way, and I hate to say that, because I still feel like we make five steps forward and 20 steps behind. Behind? Back? You know what I'm trying to say. But it's really crazy to kind of see the position where women were back in the day, where they had to learn all of these things in order to be, again, considered as worthy, where they had to learn how to cook and clean and play piano and they had to you know be submissive and they couldn't be too forceful and they couldn't be this but they had to be this and it's really crazy to see what position women were at back in the day and I just really appreciate the way that this was written so I think I'm forgetting like a million things about what I wanted to update you on right now I'll flip through the book and come back because I also have a live stream in two minutes and I need to start that I don't want to start late because that is like the official time start to the readathon so I will log off for now I'll probably read a little bit more or update you on the first sprint and let you know like all of my residual thoughts and then go to read. Hi vlog, hi vlog, hi vlog. A declaration of love. I'm so excited. Okay, I'm so excited, but also the way he went about it, Mr. Darcy. Come on. But he just said, "I love you and I admire you," and I can't wait to see where they go from here. And I love that this happens at the 50% mark because there's just so much to go down still. No preface, no nothing. I just, I gave this five stars. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into when I was reading this book. I thought it was gonna be very much a love story and only that. But Jane Austen just does such a great job at weaving in the themes of, again, womanhood in the 1800s and society and class and status and power and all of those dynamics between different, I guess, status of people. And it is so interesting to see kind of the world of the 1800s through her eyes and to see the struggles of women in a way that otherwise we really wouldn't have been able to see and I love that that is honestly the main focus of the book like beyond the romantic elements that it has and beyond you know all of the great characters that it has because as I was telling you guys before there is many characters to discuss and dissect and love with this story but beyond that what she really does achieve with this with her commentary is absolutely out of this world and it definitely makes me want to read every not necessarily Necessarily every Austin out there because I know some people like don't really like Mansfield Park and explore more of her beautiful prose because it really is stunning and there's just so many good annotations with this book so many quotes and moments that I loved and to kind of see these characters recognize that they are not all perfect and that they are all flawed and that they in some way contribute to what is wrong 
with society at this time. And I love that recognition. I love the growth. This is, I think, one of the most important notes that I took. This was on chapter 26, where I said, poor Lizzie is so weighted down by trying to please everyone in her life except for herself. And Lizzie is definitely one of those characters that is so selfless. Like she is constantly taking care of other people, taking care of Jane, of her other sisters, trying to please her mom while still pleasing her dad, while trying to navigate the world in a way where she is also pleased with what she is doing, but mostly pleasing other people. And she, although not every time she is willing to give up things, you know, to at the expense of herself, she still does that sometimes. And she is willing to do that time and time again for Jane in particular. And I really like Lizzie's selflessness and how she realizes at the end that even if it appears selfish or even if it appears like it has no explanation, some things just need to be done in order for her to be happy, even if people are not going to agree. And don't get me started on Darcy because Darcy is such a flawed character. He has a very like black and white way of seeing the world. He doesn't ever think that there's any gray areas, either yes or no, you like it or you don't. And I like his progress that he did through the book and I guess kind of Lizzie's rejection was his wake-up call towards realizing that whatever he'd been doing in the past is not the MO that he should have moving forward that it's something that has failed him time and time again and something that has gained him such a negative reputation and although Darcy is very infuriating in a lot of parts of the book because you're like when are you going to stop being an asshole he you still feel for him because there's still a sense of humanity behind behind that cold facade that he has and you see that very clearly when he proclaims his love for Lizzie and Lizzie's like sorry no not even sorry no just plain up no and you can tell that that cold facade that he has is almost like a shield to not be hurt by other people because he has been through so much i i mean i think it's to nobody's surprise that mr darcy does kind of seem like the blueprint for every other angsty emotionally constipated you know facade bad boy kind of character that came after it was a beautiful story i really love this definitely has so much reread quality to this that i I'm sure again as I reread I'll spot even more beautiful passages and just more info to take in that I will definitely be rereading this. And so now for the third and final book of this video, I do have Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I have also never read. And I am really excited about this, or at least I was extremely excited about this up until one of you told me in the comments that Dracula was like watching paint dry and then somebody agreed. So now I'm a little bit scared of how much I'm going to enjoy this. One of my best friends, considers Dracula one of her favorite books. I also have the audiobook for Dracula, which I, again, I'm ecstatic for. And this also popped up on the, on several websites actually that I looked up, like Tom Hiddleston's favorite books. BBC Radio, sometimes what they do is they put together a whole ensemble of you know, really famous A-lister actors and actresses and they put up a whole production where they do like a full cast recording audiobook. And Dracula was actually one of those that BBC Radio did. Tom Kittleston is in that cast. That is not the audiobook that I'm going to be listening to though. So I think that goes a long way with why this book is being read. Not only does he love the book, he was also in the production of the book. So I will hopefully finish this tomorrow. There and final book of the video. Let's hope it treats me well.
good morning you guys so i am well rested and i'm awake now hello and i am about to make myself my morning smoothie and update you guys a little bit on dracula i have literally only read 14 pages i really liked what i read of dracula i think it has been really atmospheric so far in what little i have read and i see now why my friend told me that whatever feels tropey now was tropey back then and i can i think i can absolutely see what she means in the sense of the character I, what's his name jonathan harker which is i mean the only person that we've really seen so far why am i putting it in this glass that is not the glass that i was meant to put that in he is on his way to obviously see count dracula and to kind of get the story started i guess as he is on his way there people are like oh darkness approaches the creatures of night travel very fast or whatever and obviously Obviously that's like I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't even say it's like tropey I would say it's just like cheesy in a way where we just see a lot of vampire stories go like that nowadays because Bram Stoker originated all of that he also was offered a cross like take this with you it will protect you so it's again kind of what we see kind of like the classic vampire lore of like oh garlic repels them and they can't look at themselves in the mirror and if they're around a cross then you know it like rebukes the evilness but it's because that's where it started and the audiobook so far is really good it's been really creepy so i not a lot i mean at the start of it it was creepy because it had music and music every time it just creeps me out and i feel like that's a book that i will probably have a lot of updates on just because i went through a big phase of my life where i only wanted to read my hair oh my god where i only wanted to read like vampire stories or where that was i guess the norm like back in like 2008 vampire stories became like super popular so i did read a lot of them back in the day i still read a lot of them because i love vampire stories and after that possibly i mean not in this video because it's not relevant to this video but at some point also read carmilla which is also one of the it outdates even dracula whatever the case is i had a good time with the 14 pages and i shall continue to read and i shall continue to update you guys as i go well hello friends i have updated it has been a minute since I last updated you. I updated you in the morning. Now it is 2.12 p.m. And I have obviously been reading Mr. Dracula. I am currently 115 pages in. I had no idea this was going to be epistolary writing. I was really surprised and fascinated that Dracula was going to be in that format. And it works so well for the story. I think even if the story, given that it's gothic literature and it's horror-y... It does go by slower than your typical books, but that's just the norm with the genre. When you look at gothic literature, it is not fast paced. It is not what you typically see with a YA fantasy, with a YA horror, even with adult horror or fantasy. That's not what you see in gothic literature. It's much more about the atmosphere, about the setting, about kind of like that sense of dread, about building up that tension. And I think epistolary writing for that works so freaking well. The tension and the anxiety inducing moments moments that we get in this book are written so freaking well and I am loving that about it. I literally at some point, let me double check what page this was in. Yeah, it was page 95 in my edition. I went this frantic feeling, holy crap, Stoker's making me anxious. That was the scene where, I mean, I should probably give you a synopsis before I dive into that, but I'm gonna say that and then give you a synopsis for this. So it's the scene where Lucy disappears at night and then she comes back with puncture wounds on her neck. Uh, the feeling that Mina is experiencing in that scene because the way that this book is written is so chopped. It's choppy writing because again, it's like a collection of memories in a way. Everything is kind of being shorthanded. It builds that tension and that anxiety to perfection. And I felt claustrophobic. Like when Mina was yelling, Lucy, Lucy, like I just, obviously I'm listening to the audiobook as well. So that also contributes to me being able to experience these words and these scenes in a different way. I felt claustrophobic and anxious about Lucy, for Lucy, for Mina, about Mina, about the situation at hand. And it was perfect. And so as to give you a synopsis for Dracula, we follow a cast of characters as a complete cast. We don't even follow Dracula himself, which I thought that's what this book was going to be. So we have a lot of different POVs in this one, but again, because it's epistolary writing, I would guess that a lot of them could potentially sound similar. But we 
primarily follow Jonathan Harker. The book starts with his POV as he goes to Transylvania to visit Count Dracula. And he is kind of, I guess, his real estate agent. And he is going to help Dracula find a home to purchase in London. But as soon as he gets to Dracula's castle, he starts kind of discovering the ins and outs of Dracula's world and how it seems and is a lot more sinister than meets the eye. And then we have a series of other events unfolding in England. We have a ship that has recently been wrecked. I literally just read that. In that particular chapter, the writing felt so choppy because it was a small recollection of each scene and the sense of, again, dread and I guess the unknown, the feeling of when am I going to be next? Oh my God, I was feeling for that character that was narrating because it was absolutely like it was a wreck, literally. Page 86. This is Log of the Demeter and it's literally four and a half pages of just date after date. It says on July 6th, on July 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 16th, 17th. Then it jumps to the 22nd and it's just little paragraphs at a time. And then we obviously have Mina's and Lucy's storyline, which are very much interwoven at the moment. I don't know if they'll be separated at some point, but Lucy is supposed to fulfill this part of the synopsis where a strange puncture wound comes about in a woman's neck. So that is Lucy. She literally disappeared at night for a bit and Mina again was super frantic and trying to find her. And then the last POV that we have is of this doctor who works at an asylum and he has this one particular, I was going to say client, but that's not the word. This patient is kind of going a little bit crazy and who's saying that his master is beconning him. Beconning him? I always say that wrong. Beckoning him. <laughs> that is beckoning him, that is calling him over, that is kind of luring him in. There was this one scene where Jonathan literally saw Dracula crawl down the castle, like his head was sticking out of a window. And Jonathan was like, oh, that's perfectly innocent. Like, that's okay. And then he sees him like literally crawl out the window and then start crawling his way down the castle. That is so horrifying. I was listening to the audiobook and I was like, oh shit. It's just so good. Like, I just, I love the description. I love the setting. It's giving me everything that I hoped and wanted and I can't wait to keep on reading. Today, however, I have my first fairy loot here with me, so we're going to unbox this. I am really excited about this. This is the May fairy loot. We'll find out when I open this. I'm not really sure, but I am really excited about this. I do know what the book is because I just, I knew, I knew, and I do already own the book. However, that doesn't mean that I'm not excited about it because this edition is about to be stunning. I just know it because fairy loot always outdoes itself with freaking books. As always, I will be leaving a link down below for it if you do want to check them out. Ah! This is so exciting, you guys. So it's got this stunning design on the box. We've got some cute feeling. I see kind of like a tumbler cup. I'm into this. First thing I see is a straw. And I, I'm i guessing this is going to be a part of the tumbler cup. And let's see. Ooh, the wrapping is nice. Let's see. What fandom is this from? We've got dragons. That is always a good first sign. This is the 13 from Throne of Glass. They just want to make my heart hurt, right? They just want to see me cry. This says, from now until the darkness claims us. Then I have this, and this says, roll the dice reading list game. Is this like a fun little TBR game? Ooh. Ooh, we've got a cute little pouch on the- this is heavy. We've got a cute little pouch with the fairy loot logo and we've got- you guys, this is heavy. Like this is- this is weighty. And this is the dies that comes with the game. If you've read A Dark and Hollow Star, you will never look at a die the same. For those of you who have, you know. And then we have got this little sheet right here, numbered 1 through 19. And I'm guessing that you just write down the book that you'd like to read and then you roll the die and whatever comes up is what you read. You know what? 
I'm not mad at that. I think that would be a really cute, like, randomized but not TBR game. Then we have a Serpent and Dove coaster set. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. Items like this is what I live for. And I have not read Serpent and Dove, but the art for Serpent and Dove is stunning. In fact, it is the art that makes me want to read Serpent and Dove. If you've read Serpent and Dove and you think I like it, let me know in the comments. We have got this character. This one right here. We've got this one. And I think this is Lou. I think this is the main character. Is that her name? Lou? I might be wrong, but I feel like maybe that's the main character. And this is, is his name Reed? I feel like those names ring a bell, but these are really pretty. I have got this. What is this? This is heavy and it's got this leaf right here. Oh, this is heavy. What is this? Wait a minute. Is this like a phone holder? Is this what it's supposed to be? It's got the hole right there for like the charger. Ray bearer, which I have yet to read, but I have heard incredible things about. Okay, so I think we only have, oh, we've got stuff down here. We've got stuff down here and we've got the book. These are big. <gasps> These are bigger than I thought. In videos, these look kind of small. These are big. Let me just grab a book and show you guys. This is the tarot card. Are tarot cards this big generally? I've never seen a tarot card in real life. And these look exactly like the characters from the coaster. So maybe these are also Serpent and Dove. But we've got the Nine of Wands. It looks exactly like the guy from the coaster set. And the girl too, the Ten of Wands. So it's, this is honestly so freaking stunning, you guys. When I tell you this is one of the things that I was the most excited about about fairy loot and then we have got the spoiler card which is this beautiful art print i am also going to save this okay so let's run through these before i jump into the actual book so the tumbler was designed by our girl tatty nora we have got the wooden phone stand which is by lady trouble letters we've got the coasters which were done by arz 20 Eight. We have got this. Oh, wait a minute. This is from Crave. Okay. So this is an art print from Crave by Tracy Wolf. Then we've got the collectible tarot card. Oh, I love those. And they were designed by Morgana Zero Anagram. And we have got this cute pouch. Hello. With the fairy loot logo, which, oh my god, you guys, I've been dreaming of this moment for like a minute. It says happy reading on the other side. Presentation wise, just like fairy loot, like outdoes themselves like every single time. So we do have some goodies on the inside. We have got this art print and the other side of it is a letter from the author and I'm seeing it right now. Yes, it is by Cyan and Smart. So it is definitely which is steeped in gold bookmark that matches the theme card for the month, which is really nice. And now for the book, we have got, oh my God. Oh my goodness. Oh my, oh wow. Under the, this looks like a classic book. This looks like one of those first print classical books, you guys. This is a stunning moment. And it is obviously signed by the author as well. This is what the book looks like. It is very oily. Look at the spine and the sprayed edges. Okay, you guys, so that is it for the unboxing, the Fairy Loot May box. I will go back to reading now. Well, hello there. I am here to finally update the vlog and to close this up too because I finished the last book of this video and that is Dracula by Bram Stoker. I am so excited that I went through all of the books in just a matter of days and that most of these were a hit. I ended up rating Dracula a 4.5 out of 5 stars. I think it was really interesting and it also, I guess it provided a lot of interesting commentary about the Victorian era and the conversation that is still to this day, it's, you know, it's, it's very controversial about science versus religion, which I guess could also apply to like magic versus science in a way. I really like the way that Bram Stoker wrote all of these nuanced conversations about the time. It was honestly so fascinating for me to read this and I honestly didn't think I would end up loving this as much as I did. I think while a lot of it feels cheesy in a way that we know vampire lore to be, this is where it started. Like Bram Stoker was definitely a master at writing that eerie, creepy, be 
atmosphere that definitely spooked me at times, especially listening to the audiobook and the voices that the actors were making for certain scenes. I was at the edge of my scene and I had the shutters at a lot of scenes in this book because while I knew this was going to be descriptive, because it's gothic literature, I didn't expect myself to have such a bodily active reaction to what I was reading. And whenever that happens in a book, that's how you know it's, it's getting to you, that the writing is resonating and the writing is good. Mina literally carried this whole book and it was insane, down to the way where she was the one taking all of the notes and keeping them safe and doing all the note taking for Jonathan and for everybody else, down to how at the second half of the book she literally became Van Helsing's right hand woman. And honestly, it's beyond me that these characters, given what happened to Lucy in the first half, didn't even realize what was happening to Mina in the second half. I mean, granted, because this book is so slow and so descriptive, there were a lot of parts of this book that felt repetitive without there being a lot of justification as to why, though I won't really fault it for it, but there were scenes that didn't really help the book and that even when I was listening to the audiobook, I was definitely zoning off on those scenes. And the interesting thing about this book is that to me, the first half of the book was so fast paced, it was so crazy, it was so creepy, and then we enter a second half of the book that in my opinion wasn't as interesting as the first half, and I don't know if I'm the only one that's experienced that with Dracula, but I definitely liked the first half of this book way better. It was also really interesting going into this book and kind of nitpicking it apart and seeing things that I now know why people say the things that they say about Mina and Lucy and about Jonathan Harker and then Dracula, because the way that their encounters are established in this book, it definitely, I don't know if it would apply as queer coding, but it definitely felt like Mina and Lucy were very much in tune with each other in a way that far surpassed friendship, and Dracula was very into Jonathan Harker as well, and so the way that I look at this towards the end of the book, it definitely came across as Dracula is targeting these women in order to get to the men, and now I understand why there's things like a diary of blood, which I'm really excited to read now. These characters constantly fluctuate between kind of hating Dracula and his nature and being terrified of him, but also pitting him a lot given the circumstances, and so it was a really interesting balance, yet it was really weird to see all of these characters fluctuate between hating him and being literally terrified that he was anywhere near them, but also being like, oh my god, I feel so sorry for him that this is the life that he has to lead. It was it was interesting. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Definite reread quality. I would probably reread it with the audiobook as well next time because that audiobook was incredible. And we are officially Mina stands in this household because the way that she came up with all the great ideas is no joke. So yeah, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video, me reading Tom Hiddleston favorite books. If you have any other celebrities you would like to see an installment on, definitely let me know down in the comments. I think this was super fun and I know there's a lot of celebrities that don't necessarily read classics, but they read rather other genres or they read a lot of poetry. I think all of that would be really interesting. So if you have any particular celebrity that you think I really vibe with the books or that you think it would be really interesting to analyze, let me know down in the comments below. If you guys watched Loki, also let me know because Loki is freaking incredible. It was so freaking good. I want to rewatch the show like so many times. If you have watched Loki or are currently watching it, also let me know down in the comments. If you have read any of these books, as always, let me know down in the comments as well. Or even if there are any classics that you'd like me to read, let me know. I definitely be down for any of those. And if you reach the end of the video, let's leave some wine emojis down below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I am constantly putting out videos that I'm sure you don't want to miss. And if you want more exclusive content from me, I do have a Patreon. We call ourselves The Citadel. And there is so much more stuff going on there. We have a Discord, Buddy Reads, a book club, podcast, weekly updates. We've got exclusive videos, exclusive live streams every Sunday, movie nights, and it's just a lot of fun over there. So if you do want to join us, I always leave the link down in the description alongside all of my social medias. Again, thank you so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video. If you guys want to check Bright Sellers out and get your own monthly wine subscription, because why the hell not? We all want a little bit of wine. We all want a little bit of a good time. And check the link down in the description that will give you 60% off your first box. And yeah, I love you guys so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys.